Hello and welcome back to Logical Magic, Examining Esoterica. Once again, my intrepid friend and very patient friend, Jacob Fluharty, is joining me to talk about something that is called emotional regulation. And it is one of the keys to having good and healthy relationships, ones that thrive rather than cause you to be triggered or fall backwards into an old energy. And it's not just about romantic relationships. One of the things that we have to remember when you hear the word relationship, don't exclusively associate it with romantic partners. Your relationships are your friendships, your colleagues. They can also be romantic partners, but they're also covering things like acquaintances. And the reason that people who have been through um, different forms of abuse, emotional abuse, uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, any of the big ones that contribute to PTSD or CPTSD, the reason that people struggle with emotional regulation, the first thing that you need to understand is that you are not taught how to process and cope with your emotions. If you grew up with reactive and explosive tempers, then what you learned as a form of emotional regulation was emotional repression. And it does not work over the long haul, and it does lead to things like being triggered and having disproportionate responses, which is what happens when people are triggered, because more than the emotion brought up by a particular set of circumstances in the here and now is being brought to the table. And so today we're going to be talking about the ways you can start mastering emotional regulation as part of your healing journey to improve all areas of your life, including your ability to succeed. Hey, Jacob, good sport that you are. Are you on board already with what we're talking about? Because like, I really do just bob <laughs> these topics at him and he's like, sure. Yeah, no, it's totally fine. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally down. All right. So how have you noticed in your life that emotional regulation has been an issue within your life after kind of identifying where it came from in your childhood? Because you and I both know where any issues that we've had with that have come from. Right. So like I am a, uh, even today, a wildly unregulated, emotionally unregulated individual. Um, part of it is definitely from the like little T traumas that, you know, grow up in an abusive household and um, having very reactive parents um, definitely contributed to that. And then of course, like being a bipolar patient, I have my emotional regulation is just all over the place anyway. Um, and so you put those two things together. I was never given a great example of emotional regulation at all. Um, and it's a skill that I've had to learn as an adult, um, which has been quite the journey, uh, I can say, for sure. It almost always is. It almost always <laughs> is. And, and the first thing to do is shelve the idea of blame against your parents or blame against yourself. Because, again, right. people only teach what they know. And when we're talking about my backstory, um, my parents were like almost homicidally reactive. They just both were, they were both only children. Um, they both were, grew up around people who had their own issues and they learned, they had explosive tempers. And right, one right. of the reasons that I'm always bringing that up is that if you suffer from problems with emotional regulation, not being able to process your feelings and being very reactive understand that there is a method that you can employ to help yourself improve in all areas. And one of the ways that it's referred to is reparenting, which is essentially where you go back and you learn to talk to yourself, your inner dialogue, and it can start with an external dialogue of how you talk to yourself, like you're doing fine. It's okay that you're nervous. If you're not, if you really hate it, you can leave after 15 minutes. These are all the things that you would say to yourself trying to overcome something like anxiety. So very, the very first thing that I want to cover is that we're still talking about spiritual um, enlightenment and what leads to it. And there are three stages in it. And one is the processing stage where you process everything and recognize everything that happened to you. And a lot of the times have to cope with the emotions. And I will send people sound recordings to aid in that process, but nothing does your work for you. There will still be some work. And Jacob, what you and I both know is that healing journeys, like we think about healing as being this soothing, wonderful, wrapped in a comforter, broth chicken soup type of thing. And it sucks. We, we need to talk about that more. The first stage. Oh, I agree. Oh, yeah, for sure. Difference. No one tells you that, like that up front, right? Like you are, they put you on this, this path where they're like, you know, this is going to be helpful and everything's going to be great and blah, blah, blah. But the growth, like 
it, growing pains, it's called that for a reason, right? We all remember growing up and how much that sucked. And it, there was physical pain involved. And much in the same way, like emotional healing comes with its own kind of set of difficulties and, and pains along the way. Like it's not always going to be just like, let's listen to this really calming music and just feel healed. Like, no, there's growth and there's, uh, it hurts, you know, <laughs> but you got to put the work in. Well, when you look at it as like, we have tendency to approach our emotional response system and our physical body as being two separate things. And here's the thing, your emotional response system, remember our brain controls everything. So whether or not somebody's punching you in the nose and you feel pain because of that, or you feel emotional upset and pain because of an emotion that has sparked a chemical reaction in your brain that causes you to feel something, it is mm -hmm. almost the same thing. One right. of the things when we're talking about healing is people really do need to understand, think of it like physical therapy. If you absolutely blew out your knee and you had to have it surgically reconstructed, you would expect some pain, some limping, some stumbling, and a slow pace at first. And that is the best analogy for what emotional healing will feel like. And if you go into it experiencing those emotions, but being able to tell yourself with confidence, because it really is true, if you keep at it, it will work. I'm living proof. If you keep at it, you will be able to get through it. But because the processing stage, which is where you confront the ways in which you may have been victimized and the things that you need to heal, which people can get stuck in that because they don't have any help getting through it. That is the best stage to seek out emotional help in a professional capacity. Now, I am not a registered, licensed anything, and I'm not pretending to be. So this is where I start talking about if you are in the emotional processing stage and you can afford therapeutic help, then please seek it out because somebody who is trained to trauma can help guide you through those steps and keep you emotionally safe. Unfortunately, not everybody can, as you have been experiencing with <laughs> bipolar. You can be separated from clinical help by financial deprivation or lack of availability. There are many things that might keep people and like not being able to find the therapist that you click with as well. But as right. in, this is going to be put up after Megumi's episode. And one of the things that Megumi did so well and aided her journey was that she did not look to one source for her healing. And I need people to hear that diversify in your approach, get as much information as you can, including clinical, which is the 3D. And here is why. I am actually a spiritual advisor and a spiritual worker, but I believe very strongly in understanding things from the 3D perspective, because speaking solely in the woo-woo world, we need each element to be represented for balance. And this is the earth element. All the 3D stuff about executive functioning, which is something that we're going to talk about, and the five personality traits that you're trying to master in order to have strong emotional regulation, which will allow you to be successful in all areas of your life. Now, Jacob, you, you are somebody who has to self-regulate a great deal and go forward into things not feeling super well, but being aware that you will be. Is how are you like that you're going to have a particular response to a particular set of circumstances? Like if you have a call with your boss, you're nervous beforehand, right? <laughs> yes. Right? Great example. Yes. And and you had to learn the tools of how to talk to yourself beforehand to lessen the impact on your emotional structure, correct? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's basically like I just I learned along the way how to give myself really good pep talks. Um, because I for me personally, I just have to remind myself that most of the intrusive thoughts are just that. They're just intrusive thoughts. Like uh, I play the what if game really, really well with myself. Um, what if this happens? What if that happens? Um, and most of that is not even based in reality. Um, I have no experience to make me think that that's going to occur that way. Um, but that's the fun thing about anxiety, right? It's not based in reality a lot of the times, uh, or it's, or it, it is extrapolating a very minute, uh, part of it and then just blowing it up into, you know, turning it to 11 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's kind of how I approach it. It's just like, I just have to like give myself that pep talk and I don't go so far as like looking myself in the mirror, although I mean, maybe sometimes I should, uh, but it's just like, yeah, learning how, like we, you know, I've talked about before is like restructuring how you talk to yourself and reframing your like current reality with that conversation with yourself. And and that is very important to recognize. And by the way, if talking to yourself in the mirror would help you, then do. And I encourage people to talk to themselves. Oh, yeah, for sure. Statements <laughs> as well. 
not I statements, you statements, and here is why. The missing piece in your ability to function on that foundational level is because you did not hear a caretaking voice that was productive rather than destructive. And so mm-hmm. speaking to yourself in you statements, and I encourage people to literally talk into voice memo and then listen to it later because you can hear your own voice talking to you about how you can do this. I believe in you. You're getting better at this. You've made progress. Don't mm-hmm. just look at the areas in which you still have grant ga- ground to gain. Look at the ways in which you have improved. And that was key in my own because I did not have access to a therapist. There has been a lot of financial deprivation in my life following a divorce, which really, really, really needed to happen. And I do have a much better life. You can actually be happier with less if you are emotionally healthier. Please remember that part. So we've talked about the processing, how we that leads to understanding, which is the perspective difference, where you start stepping outside of your own personal pain, and it's called ego death in a spiritual journey, where you step outside of yourself, you see the ways in which you have contributed to situations, which is not the same thing as blaming yourself. Like mm-hmm. my relationship choices are absolutely responsible for the bad relationships that I've had. And I've had a lot of relationships and I have found that until such time as I am healed, I should probably, I'm going to focus on my relationship with myself is the easiest way to shorthand that because that way everything improves. And one of the things that we run into in this journey is the ability to look at ourselves without guilt or shame. Please understand that we have talked so much about your backstory. We've talked a lot about my backstory. And please understand that if you, too, have a tumultuous or a traumatic backstory, that you need to start letting yourself off the hook. If you did Mm -hmm. not see any better, it's hard to do any better. How did you run into that in your early relationionships? Um, As Like as far as? How, how did like the relationship styles that you saw around you, how did they impact the relationships that you had? Because they do determine it. And that's why healing yeah. it is key. I think, well, for me, like my early relationships, especially were, uh, it was almost like a seesaw. Like I saw the relationships around me and I was perceiving the relationships around me in one way. And I saw them as like these like healthy um happy relationships. I was like, oh, I really want that. And I was striving for that. Because the relationships I saw growing up, like, you know, as a child, you don't really perceive like your parents' relationship uh, in a, in, like in a, in a real way, obviously. Yeah, they're like gods to you. They're like gods right. to you. It, but even, gro- even as a child, I understood that like my parents didn't have the best relationship. Like I could still, you know, you could still pick up on like the conflict and the strife and the, and the whatnot. And, you know, my Mom has been divorced numerous times. Not to like, I'm not raking her here. This is no, real. Not. Your mom started uh, having relationships right. at a young age. And so, like, I had one good, I had one good positive relationship that I can think of, and it's like my grandmother and her husband. Um, I still hold them to this like pinnacle of this is what a healthy, productive relationship looks like. Even to this day, they are like the most perfect relationship I can think of. Um, but so I was trying to balance what I saw in my friends and saw in my, you know, people around me versus what I grew up with. And I was having a really hard time, like trying to, you know, like find that balance because I was having difficulties uh, maintaining healthy relationships. And I couldn't understand why, like, I couldn't have what my friends were having. But then I was like, oh, am I just like doomed? And as I got older, I started to like realize how dysfunctional, like, the relationship, the adult relationships that I had experienced growing up were, and I was like, well, am I just doomed to this reality of like, you know, am I just going to grow up to be my parents and just unhappy all the time? Like, uh, I don't know, it just didn't make sense. And so I was struggling with that a lot. And I was like trying to force something that wasn't, that wasn't my story, I guess, to put yeah, Put it that you're, way. you're trying to live behind the facade. That's a very, very normal. right. Because I wasn't doing any healing on my own, and I wasn't trying to like figure out my role in all of this. I, when I was perceiving it, it was just, well, there's nothing that I can do. I'm just kind of doomed to these kind of you know lackluster or, or relationships that are filled with so much um, turmoil. Um, instead of understanding, like, well, your relationship, your relationships are in turmoil mostly because of the decisions that you're making, um, because you never healed in x y and z way and now you're just kind of like not taking it out on your partner but like kind of i was though like i i just i was not i was not willing to take the steps that were needed for me to grow to be a healthy partner to you know another person instead i was just blaming the circumstances of 
my upbringing. And that's you know. the processing stage where like you're understanding that things happened, but you haven't taken the additional step of understanding, which understanding does involve looking at yourself and seeing the behaviors, the red flags you fall off, flow off, mm-hmm. the ways in which you behave. And it's not about not liking yourself. It's about seeing yourself so that you can do better and have better outcomes. And please, well, sure, yeah, and the, no one wants to see that mirror like turned upon themselves, right? Like it's a very it's difficult. difficult. It's difficult because, yeah. like, like, I can be a real booger, and like you know that. Yeah. Well. Like I'm, I'm just like I'm a delightful human being on so many levels. But the very things that make me like a delightful human being make me impossible to deal with. Oh yeah, that me. was that was yeah. I think the hardest part of the hardest part of like getting out of my marriage was looking back like those first two years afterwards, like I had to look back and take a very serious like inventory of like, you know, yes, I'm a delightful individual and I'm a lot of fun and a lot of people like me and blah, 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 blah. But I was a, uh, oh, watch my language today. Um, but I was an absolute terror and it was a really, <laughs> it was a really hard pill to swallow looking back on that 10 years and like trying to understand what I did and like take responsibility for that uh, and not just blame the situation or not just blame my husband or whatever. And just like, understand that there was a lot of growing that I needed to do that. I just didn't. And unfortunately by the time it, I was willing to, you know, do that, that work, it was a little too late, you know? And so, yeah, that was a, that was a for tough pill to swallow. For that relationship. <laughs> that was what we call a test pancake relationship where you're testing yeah. things out and it's like, well, this batter needs to be adjusted. And please understand, Jacob, you have me for company. When I talk about like the catastrophically unhealthy environment in which I grew up and it was bizarre. Like even when I'm trying to tell therapists about it, it's like, there is almost nothing normal in there except like your grandmother saving like a miser to send you to summer camp to get away from you. Because like, I have a lot of compassion for my poor grandmother, who was my main caretaker, the the alcoholic one, Um, she got stuck with her, quite frankly, crazy son's daughter. And like it really, and she was a widow and she was very, very, very depressed and she drank chronically and constantly. And she did not like me and she made it clear. But as an adult, I look back and I'm like, well, I just feel kind of sorry for the poor lady. Like she had one child. She did actually seem to engineer that in her life so that she could marry my grandfather, who she was very in love with. And it was way back when. And like she wasn't considered to be from a completely suitable family. She did get pregnant before they got married, which at the time was like considered very shameful. And so she had this big cover story about how he was born at six months and spent time in an incubator. And the time period, it's like, yeah, that wasn't happening. (laughs) Like no adult ever bought it. But man, she tried to sell it with conviction because she was controlled by so much shame. And that's why we need to talk about when you are looking at yourself to have an understanding eye, please understand that shame will hold you back more than anything else in a healing journey. Please, Mm -hmm. please, please forgive yourself for whatever it is that you've done and try to do better. And that is the way we make amends. And that is the way we atone. And every now and then we have somebody that we need to approach with like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Like this is like a a part of the part and parcel of the toxic dysfunction that I was steeped in as a child that then I hit you with the shrapnel of what was still in caught side of me. And am I talking about me specifically? Yes, I really genuinely am. I refer to that over and over again. Every relationship I had in my 20s, I was some different form of toxically dysfunctional. And (laughs) when I look back now. I had no way of being anything other because literally people would hit each other until they were bleeding in front of me when I was. So that was what I saw as a relationship dynamic. I have literally no memories of my parents together being happy, not even one. I have multiple ones of them trying so hard to kill each other that there was blood flying. And that is just part of my origin story. And the only reason I bring it up because I'm fine. I can talk about it without having emotional access to me. And that is the role of understanding, the stepping outside of yourself so that you no longer feel things so personally because you have a level of detachment to your, essentially your structure, the architecture of what went into making you. You have a more a greater level of detachment when you step outside of yourself and start considering yourself with the same level of compassion you would extend towards another person. Now, if you do not have compassion for somebody who came from a set of dysfunctional or toxic circumstances and then enacted the behaviors that they witnessed, work on that because it's the key to freedom for you. 
If you are enacting things that are based in impulsivity and an inability to control it because nobody helped you understand what is called emotional regulation, that is being able to have an emotion, understand you're having it, understand why you're having it, I'm angry because, but not expressing that anger because your emotions don't control you, you are aware of them. They inform the ways in which you take care of yourself. That is what the key to responding, not reacting, is you have an emotion and you know how you need to respond to it within you in a way that is productive rather than destructive. And mm -hmm. that stage of stepping outside of yourself is key to that. And then that's what leads to spiritual enlightenment in terms of being in alignment with your authentic self, with your divine self. And if you're a romantic person, that is one of the things that prepares you for your divine partner or union. And does everybody come here seeking union? No, they do not. So understand that there are plenty of people. Remember, we talk about this like taking a major. There are plenty of people who come here for a different experience. And in fact, you'll encounter people who come here for a hedonistic one. And that is the journey that they chose this particular time. We are meant mm -hmm. to mix with people within our own collective. So sure. we're going to switch gears ever so slightly because one of the things that poor impulse control or being reactive mm -hmm. leads to is often suppressive tactics, which include imbibing substances, taking drugs, engaging in escapism, including escaping into a fantasy world that can be associated with dissociative thinking, which don't blame yourself. If you have a problem with being triggered and dissociating from the moment, it happened to you because you were terrified as a small person. There was right. nobody there to comfort you. And so your brain in a protective capacity sent you to a different part of your consciousness to help preserve you. That's what happened to you. If you are, if you get emotionally triggered, what happened was nobody helped you take care of your emotions. So your poor little brain had to figure out a way to keep itself safe. And that's what it did. It would jettison your consciousness for just long enough for the big hoop to go down. And then you come back. When you yeah, start. Now I see why you wanted me to, now I see why you wanted me on this episode. Uh, yeah, we, we both, we, we <laughs> both have PTSD. And like, I've learned to really work with it and understand it, but it was a process. And part of the reason that I wanted to do all these podcasts is like I said, I did not and do not have the financial means to seek out high level help. And so I had to do all of this on my own. Now, again, I cannot stress this enough. If you are able to get a trained professional into your life, please do so. They are yes, trained, they're licensed, and they know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. But if circumstances keep you from that, you can still go towards healing. It will involve a lot of awareness and a lot of uh, kind of the ability to stick to something, perseverance and discipline, which we talked about that in the seven energies episode. So what we're talking about with impulsivity and then reaching for the wrong tools is often addictive behaviors or substance abuse. And mm -hmm. there are studies mostly out of the UK. I was just reading one this morning, that they actually don't believe that there is a genetic component to addiction. They don't know what precisely causes it. What it hmm. can be is generational trauma that leads to poor coping mechanisms, and you do what you see. That is why people so often repeat a pattern. You will do what you see. But awareness is the key to being able to, well, I have a tendency towards poor escapists or substance abuse retreats, and you have to be on top of that and start training yourself to go towards healthful habits. Like if you're getting triggered, one of the, and please remember, this is not going to be appropriate for everybody. So check with a medical doctor to make sure that you can actually do it. But if you can, one of the easiest ways to start taking out a trigger is you need to be aware of it. It's like, I'm not in the here and the now, now you have to start talking to yourself about nothing is happening to me right now. I am safe in the here and the now I am having a disproportionate response because of old issues. And mm -hmm. then start taking steps to ground yourself in your body, bring yourself as hard as you can into your physical body, not by throwing things, not by screaming, not by yelling, which is what people with poor coping skills learn from their dysfunctional caretakers, but rather through regimented exercise can help or regimented habits. So you can listen to upbeat music and dance around. The reason that you want to do a mild form of cardio, it does not have to be high intensity, is because the easiest way to change your energy is to literally change your body chemistry by inducing something positive. 
raising your heart rate at a moderate late rate. So it really can be just standing and doing a step tap or marching in place for at least five minutes. Now there's a spiritual component because five is the number of change within a spiritual component, but it's also takes roughly that long for your body to start to release the thing that will help your brain the most endorphins. You need things within your brain to be released that will naturally calm you, that will naturally help you cope better, that will soothe that feeling of like that jangled, horrible feeling of having that anxiety response. Even though it feels counterintuitive, and again, cannot stress this enough, make sure it's medically appropriate for you. Mild cardio is the easiest way to start breaking yourself out of a trigger. And then the other thing that you can do is do something that mentally engages you after that in the here and the now. And I use, um, I think it's called Mind Games. It's a it's an app that has uh, vaguely challenging, they're not particularly challenging, at brain exercises. So it'll have low level math or shape shifting or being able, is this concrete or is it, you know, it's, uh, uh, I'm absolutely forgetting the word right now. Um, it, it will have you focus on determining things within the here and the now, and that will keep your consciousness here. Make it so that it's not so challenging that you can feel like it's failure, but a crossword puzzle, a computer game in which you are doing that and it's not timed, but it will help ground you because that's the key to getting away from that dissociative problem, from that feeling of no longer having control is dropping into the here and the now. And when you are triggered, you need to learn to take care of you. And that does include disengaging from the person who may be triggering you by admitting I'm triggered right now. And if somebody will not respect that, because uh, quite frequently um, people who have dysfunctional relationships will accidentally hook up with partners who trigger them on purpose to have a feeling of control. And that is something that I've experienced for a long, long period of time. And it was very destructive to my mental health. But I did manage to start recognizing it towards the end because I kept catching the person doing it. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, you're you're doing that to me on purpose and I can see it. Um, and he had also admitted to me that he did like to. Um, he thought of it as a game where he would ask people questions that he knew that he was expressing things he didn't really feel to see what their reaction would be, which is exactly like I like to pull people's strings and see how the dance monkey dance. And that mm -hmm. was that was my partner for quite some time. Um, being able to recognize that that's what he was doing gave me the determination to cure it. I'm like, yeah, nobody's ever going to play me like a violin again. So I'm going to learn how to string myself very appropriately. Right. And, and the thing is, it does work. So let's talk about, as we're talking about what a dysfunctional atmosphere or an abusive atmosphere can do to your ability to have executive functioning, which executive functioning are mental skills that include working memory, flexible thinking, and self-control that enable us to plan, focus, and remember instructions and multitask. And these are all things that are very challenging to abuse survivors because they do have to do with being in a regulated, scheduled environment in which people act productively rather than destructively. But the good news is you can go back and retrain yourself. Here are the five personality traits that contribute to having low level executive functioning and being a little bit tripped out, which is the things these are addressing. The things we're talking about when you're taking the guns, the bullets out of that trigger gun, or we're trying to work on these five personality traits. Openness, which is recept being receptive to novel ideas, new ways of thinking and change. Um, and then to have uh, different experiences without fear. Openness is, and when we're talking about manifesting, openness, which is not being attached to outcomes, you may have heard it referred to as, is the easiest way to start uh, desensitizing yourself to being hyper anxious or hyper reactive, is mm -hmm. slowly introducing new experiences. Again, I was talking earlier about how you would talk to yourself as you're approaching something new. It's fine. If you hate it, you can leave after 15 minutes and get ice cream on the way home. Whatever it might be, the thing that helps you get through something is desensitizing yourself to experience in a safe environment. And if you start choosing it actively, when it comes at you unexpectedly, you will find that you have amassed the skill set that helps you cope with it in the here and the now. And then we have conscientiousness, which is discipline and perseverance. We talked about that in the seven energies. So there's going to be a lot of echoing. All of these are very, very interrelated. And in fact, there are seven executive functions, which was cracking me up when I was writing everything down, that everything comes with the number seven attached to it. 
um, which is also organization, organization and self-control. One of the ways to start having self-control is talking to yourself appropriately. And then one of the ways to develop organizational skills is to set small goals for yourself. If you are dealing with agoraphobia, a lot of people who grow up in threatening atmospheres uh, retreat into agoraphobia. That is something I also had to conquer because like I got everything <laughs> and, then, and then joyfully unpacked it. Not so joyfully, but at least successfully. Um, one of the ways to start conquering that is to set, I will walk around the block today. I will go to the grocery store. I will. And you always give yourself permission to exit a scenario when you are overwhelmed. And this is, again, if you hear these things and you're like, there's no way I can do that, please do not forget medications exist for a reason. And you can talk to a general practitioner about your psychiatric symptoms. And please don't react to mental illness differently than you do to physical illness, because it is simply another system within your body that is having too much control over your here and your now. And that's really the only difference. It is an emotional situation versus a physical situation, but there are medications that can help with it. There are techniques that can help with it. Um, and then we have extroversion, which is like every single anxiety disordered person, which I am one, is usually an introvert because they like to kind of groom and curate their social experiences. You do not have to become an extrovert in order to be healthy. But what you do need to be able to do is to in interact in a, a social situation in order to succeed and in order to heal. So as you desensitize yourself to that, and if you're really, really sensitive to social situations, if you're not conquering agoraphobia, do things like go to busy parks, busy malls. You do not need to interact with people, but you need to start desensitizing yourself to stressful situations in small and manageable trunks while you have control. And that's another key. To it. How have you noticed that, dude? Because you're very extroverted, but you also have a lot of anxiety. No, Yeah, uh, I mean... I, I'm a big I'm a big uh, fan of exposure therapy, as we call it. Um, taking things small chunks at a time, just like you just described. Like if you have you know social anxiety, something just as simple as like you said, go to a park or to a mall where there's a large group of people. You don't even have to interact with anybody. Got it. Um, I don't know, so because mine is kind of gone up and down, right? It's like I've always been very outgoing and loquacious and funny and blah blah blah, and I didn't realize until much later that that was kind of like a, a coping mechanism for you know growing up in an environment where I was not necessarily um, valued. I, I said I don't want to say that because I don't want people to hear this and think that you know my parents or my family didn't value me. That's not what I'm saying per se. Oh, oh, goodness, can we address that for just one second because yeah. we just have it as a blanket statement. Like, I'm familiar, we've told each other our backstories and everything. Now, my parents were incredibly toxic, and we're not talking about them. But your parents yeah. were largely well-meaning people who got married as kids, and they simply did, had not developed impulse control because they were under the age of 25, which the right. age of 25 is when your brain finishes developing. Hey, guys, guess what's the last thing to develop? Impulse control. Yeah. So all that happened to your parents was they undertook things that they were not ready to undertake because they lacked the skill set and they lacked the maturity. But your parents love you and very loving people can make a bunch of mistakes. I should sure. know. I'm like, am I a person who is mistake free? Is I'm always saying, oh, my God, no, I am not. <laughs> so we are not in any way slamming your parents. And it is a, it's a given that you're a loved person because you still have relationships with these people. But nobody For gets sure. a machine. Yeah. And so it there is worth in being able to look back at your own history to understand yourself but it will never be about judging or blaming your parents, but rather understanding yourself. So that'll be my only disclaimer on uh, this episode. Uh, so yes. We really want to do it. <laughs> so, we just yeah, claimed so, the hell out of that one. <laughs> I, uh, growing up, I thought that if I were, um, if I was interesting and funny and outgoing, then I would get that validation. My, you know, the people around me would like me more. And I, and I rode that train for a really long time. Um, and I still do to a certain degree. Um, but as I gotten, as I've gotten older, I've realized that I guess I'm not as extra as actually like naturally extroverted as I thought I was. Um, if I don't have to leave my house, I'm not going to. I would much prefer to sit at home uh, with my animals and watch TV or read or do stuff like that. Uh, don't worry, I like being out in public and I enjoy those things. But even today, like I, I thought about this the other day and. 
Um, even now, when I go out, a lot of the time, I am still combating this um, like internal like struggle of not like do these people really like me? Do they do they really want me around? Well, to be sure that they like me and they want me around, I'm going to be as fun as I possibly can. I'm going to make sure that everyone is laughing. I'm going to make sure everyone thinks I'm just like the bee's knees because then they'll want me around some more and um, I don't have to worry about, you know, I don't know. I, I still project a lot, even though like I cognitively understand like what's going on. Um, and I'm not nearly as, you know, tied to that anxiety anymore but it's like even now with all the healing and the therapy like i'm still i'm still that scared 10 year old a lot of the time and i uh you know I'm, i still project those behaviors um so yeah i would say that i present as a natural naturally extroverted person but in reality a lot of it is still a facade unfortunately well, and, and and please understand, literally everybody you ever encounter has self-doubt within them. It is a natural thing. It is a normal thing. It is more pronounced in people who weren't taught ways in which to understand and love themselves, which is one of the goals of good parenting. But as we talked about in other episodes, like only 50% of people can even have a ghost of a chance of laying claim to having been raised in an emotionally healthy capacity. Right. So and understand I, I have really got a lot of company. And I've learned how to, I think the big thing for me personally was learning how to be by myself. Um, I talked to you a lot about it you know, like when I moved back in 2020 and it was the first time I'd ever lived on my own. It was the first time I ever, ever really had to struggle with loneliness. And I, you know, overcorrected a lot. And by being overly, you know, uh, outgoing and I, there was not a party I didn't go to. There wasn't even in the midst of like, you know, as much as we could during, you know, COVID lockdown and whatnot, like I was doing everything that I could to be as social as possible because that loneliness was so crippling because I didn't have a sense of self-worth at that point. Exactly. Uh, and so I was just trying to overcompensate still, you know, as a 30 something. Um, so, I mean, that's where my change is now where like. I still go out and I still do those things and I still, you know, sometimes overcompensate, but at the end of the day, like I'm just fine being by myself now. And that was a really hard hill to climb, but I'm glad I finally made it. Um, and it, there's so much worth in it. And that is another thing to understand is that there's something called neuroticism, which is the other trait that are the big five personality traits and your level of neuroticism, which please don't take that as an insult. These are definitions. And a neurotic response simply means that your central nervous system has a very pronounced response to something. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you grew up in an unsafe environment, Please understand that you never learned being calm and being stable and being safe as your base setting. Instead, your base setting was needing to be hyper aware, hyper alert, very mm -hmm, anxious, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very anxious. If you were, in fact, in some ways programmed to be very anxious, you yeah. would have to take the steps to deprogram and reprogram. Well, and sometimes that extroversion is exactly that. It's just a response to not having that control. If you are the extroverted person in the room, you control the room. And so you like you don't have to worry about that anxiety because you are in control of that that social setting, right? And uh which can be really annoying for everyone else around you sometimes. Oh, you're, you're, you're pointing out something so important. A lot of people, and we all do uh, employ inefficient or unhealthy coping mechanisms as a way to try and assuage those feelings within, to try and make ourselves feel better, to add balm to the wounds. And mm -hmm. one of the ways that a lot of people who are anxious, they are not naturally abusive people, but they become controlling at a level that can turn towards emotional abuse, trying mm -hmm. to seek a feeling of emotional safety by mm -hmm. thinking that they control the outcomes. That will never be the answer, yep. yo. The answer yep. is, that was me. <laughs> the answer is always going to be learning how to have temperate, that's the whole moderation self-control, and patient responses. Mm -hmm. They do not need to know the outcomes nor control them or have rigid definitions about what you will allow into your life 
If you believe in your own ability to swerve with whatever punch is coming towards you or to go with the flow as it is described in spiritual contexts. And that's what going with the flow really means is that you have confidence and faith in your own ability to rise to the needs of the moment. But the only way to be able to rise to the needs of the moment is to one, understand your needs and learn how to address them appropriately. And here's the thing that happens in toxic and dysfunctional relationships because you did not get it from a caretaker growing up, many people inappropriately seek it within their adult friendships and romantic relationships. Is somebody else helping you take care of your emotions? Mm -hmm. And it, in particularly in very gendered societies, which we live in a very gendered society. Hey, I have like a like a bit of a lightning bolt for y'all. Everything that you think about gender is a socially programmed response. Yep. We are the way we approach, we have gender roles that are defined by society. And we think men are supposed to be this and women are supposed to be that. And that anybody who doesn't fit within that is doing something wrong. And it's like, or maybe our definitions are ridiculously rigid and limiting and reductive again, right. for reasons that have to do with making a larger power structure work in a way that the people in power want it to work, which is not the same thing as it being good for you. So please remember that part. So one of the things that people have to learn in emotional regulation is that it is actually your job to understand your feelings. And sometimes you will need to talk to a friend to really get something off your chest. But for the most part, this is an internal process that we learn to engage in. And that whereas talking about your feelings can make you feel better because you're getting it out, you know what will make you feel a lot better? Solving them. Problem, problem solving, learning how to address an emotional need with the appropriate set of circumstances and actions to take care of it, to solve the problem. So what I was talking to a friend about at lunch the other day, I told her, you know, pro problem solving so that you can learn to slay your dragons, solve mm -hmm. your problems, slay your dragons, solve your problems, sl slay your dragons. Meaning that if you want to be in charge of your personal power, the first thing you need to do is have understanding of self. And in, when it comes to magic and manifesting, that is about controlling your power. The first one, because we do deal with that. By the way, you were talking about agreeableness, which is to what extent, that's one of the five personality traits. To what extent are you concerned with the feelings of others and how easily do you form bonds, appropriate bonds? And you, in an effort to feel safer and make sure that you wouldn't be lashed out against, which is at the root of that, like everybody to like you. And that's absolutely yeah, yeah. a normal thing. I think the, the, the so word of, yeah, appropriate there is the important. Yeah, exactly yeah. appropriate. I form, I form many, many bonds in my life. Many of them are not appropriate. <laughs> well, and then it gives people a little bit too much control over you because you're overly concerned with whether or not they like you. And the key of course, to yeah. feeling is, is learning how to like you no matter where you are in your journey. And you can like yourself simply because you're trying so damn hard, by the way. This right, and there's also there's like this idea of like not everyone has to like you. I think is something exactly. that I struggle with. Right, like I, and I've talked to you about stuff that I don't want to be too like it's open okay. with right now. But yeah. like, there are definitely relationships that I have both personally, professionally, you know, everywhere where um, there needs to be a conflict, <laughs> but I refuse to have the conflict. <laughs> um, I don't need to be, you know, have this relationship with, with, you know, certain people that I have these relationships with, but because I don't like that strife and that conflict, I, but at the end of the day, it, it makes everything so much worse, which is something I'm dealing with right now, where it's just like, being able to so confront hard. appropriately is what you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. That, that's 100% confront appropriately. Cause now I've dug myself into too far of a, of I know the situation here. you're talking about. We're not going to talk about it. Yeah, here. we're not going to talk I'm about laughing. it. Like, I'm like, like oh, dude, I feel you. But yeah, they're like that's that's what the situation I find myself in. Where like I, I'm in this inappropriate relationship, not like in a, you know what I mean. No, um, I know what you're talking about, and it's not a romantic relationship in a lot. Yeah, of no, 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 no. And it's just like I need to be able to have these conflicts, but. I'm finding it very difficult to do so because I've already created, I've already set the standard, <laughs> so to speak. And whoops, here we are. So um, yeah. And that's the other thing, like, like I want anyone to feel like, you know, you can know everything that you know, and you're still going to screw up sometimes guys. And that's okay. It's all exactly. about the journey. And just remember that you're not a failure. It's all a journey. Well, and what you need to remember is remember the analogy of viewing yourself as a house that was built upon a foundation. And that if your foundation is flawed, that you may need to go back and repair it. And it may need extra work because not that it's a faulty foundation, but that it has particular challenges and understand that some of the things when they're very profound and deep, 
deeply pronounced reactions, it may always be something that you need to be on top of. And for me, my biggest challenge has been learning what being impatient means in my life, because at the root of it, always, I'm afraid something is going to go wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so whenever I feel impatient, exactly, I need this to be over with so it can be solved. And so I feel that feeling. I always, I get cards in the morning that mark patience. Whenever I see the patience card in my morning draws, I'm like, that is not a record. That's not saying you're going to need to be patient. Wait, something's coming. What it's saying is you're going to have a challenge to your patience. Be aware. Awareness is the key to being able to control yourself. And awareness, true awareness, involves understanding. And that's where that whole Mm -hmm. ego death and understanding thing comes in. Now, the first stage is processing where you really will. um, This is like you're talking about the things you want to go too deeply into. Man, the stuff that I'm willing to be like, yeah, look at this. Here we go. Well, see, that's the thing. (laughs) Like, I am pretty much an open book and I will talk about a lot of things, but you know, I don't know. I I get it. And I don't need to start strife with my personal life. Like, I will tell you a lot of uh, stuff about Uh, myself. (laughs) But when things are actively happening, I might shy away from it a little bit (laughs) until there's a resolution appropriate boundaries that is how appropriate boundaries the thing i was just about to go into is when i go into this ridiculously traumatic backstory when my grandmother set the house on fire um like i actually said something very unkind to her now when i think about it it was the exact same way that she spoke to me but I was 12 years old. I woke up in a house on fire. The only reason I'm alive is because I saved my own butt <laughs> and, and hers too. Um, and the firemen were just absolutely astounded that I didn't die, quite frankly. And that was the whole thing where I got woken up. What I said to my grandmother was, you almost killed me, you stupid drunk. Mm-hmm. And for many, many, many years, I felt terrible about that because she went to the hospital, was evaluated. They found out she had cancer of essentially the everything and she was dead within six months. Wow. And it was one of the last like things that before that piece of knowledge clicked in that I ever said to her, did I take it back? I did. But when it took me well into my adult life to realize oh, she called you stupid all the time. Like I was, I was actually just mirroring things that she said to me that when I said that to her, it was one of the few times that I took power within a situation. Now that's not an appropriate way to speak to somebody and I wouldn't do it today. But I had to be able to forgive myself for being a terrified child who woke up in a house on fire. Oh, sure. Yeah, the response is understandable, for sure. She dies. And then three years later, and remember, my parents are divorced when I was six. My mother's living in another state entirely. I hardly ever see her. And, like, she just didn't have an interest in being a parent. Unfortunately, I, I turned out to look almost exactly like her. When you're dealing with a narcissist, then that's actually not the best thing because they claim a lot of ownership over you. And so by the time my father died, when a couple of weeks before my 16th birthday, um, very dramatically, and I won't go into that because it's kind of, it's often some of the things that happened to me were are upsetting for other people to hear. So I kind of gloss over them. He died when I was 15, right before 16. There's a bunch of other, oh my God, tragedies. I had to go, you know, live totally uprooted again at the age of 16, went to live with somebody who criticized me constantly, picked on my appearance, my weight, my everything, because she saw me as herself because I looked like her. And so she was trying to live vicariously through me and she took out all of her self-loathing on me. And it was horrible. And I totally admit that. But I never allowed myself to feel any grief. Grief was a foreign concept to me. When somebody had somebody die and they were all sad, I was like, what's wrong? Like I kind of, it was mystifying to me because I had never had the luxury to feel any of those feelings. Trauma survivors are stuck in survival mode. When you are in survival mode, it's very difficult to process. You need to be in a state of being where you allow yourself to process those feelings. And guess what I got to feel starting four years ago for a good two years was all of the grief that I had suppressed. And it was profound and awful. And I was like, this is going to kill me. And it hurt because like it caused a lot of chest pain and luckily I'm in great shape so like I wasn't concerned that I was dying but it was like this is insanely painful it was excruciating um and I kept telling myself as it was going on and I would literally sob for hours at a time this won't last forever once it's over at least it will be over I'm getting everything out so that I can learn how to feel things to the appropriate degree and that is the point of processing that is because it's not picking at your scabs, which like psychotherapy can be a little bit like that, poking at it till it bleeds again. Then you look go and it's like, what's the end result here? What's the what's the goal? The goal of emotional processing, understanding the feelings that exist around the things that happen to you and allowing yourself to safely feel them is that 
in the future, when you have those feelings, you will not be what? Triggered. You will not be triggered. You will be having the appropriate depth of emotional response to the stimulus within the moment, meaning that you're reacting to what's happening now versus bringing all of the unpacked crap in your personal closets and suitcases to the moment, which is what happens when people are triggered, particularly CPTSD triggers and PTSD triggers, in which you are unmoored. Essentially, you no longer have the foundation in the here and the now and all of the weight of all of that unprocessed unconfronted, ignored emotion tries to come out. It's like there's all this back pressure behind it. And that's why people have what's called a disproportionate response. If you are prone to disproportionate responses, forgive yourself now, please. You didn't do it to yourself, but if you go towards learning the the skills and the tools, you can learn how to process that stuff. And you can then learn to have appropriate responses within the here and the now. And it does involve in the head and the heart battle, keeping the heart in one place and the head in the other and having the head participate in understanding your feelings. So you are striking that balance, particularly Mm -hmm. when people are overwhelmed in that stage. That's where the role of a therapist or an advisor comes in, is helping talk you down from your ledges, helping you step outside when you're getting too mired up in that feeling. That is the role of therapy. Whenever I meet somebody who's like, that's a form of weakness, it's like, no, being afraid again to help is a form of weakness, dude. That is going to keep you the same level of sick your whole life. It is much stronger to go towards help and unpack your crap so that you can be the mighty version of you rather than the one that learned how to control yourself by ignoring yourself. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, that it's like, I hate this idea of like weakness because like that idea of weakness is another socially constructed thing, right? Like we're still trying to like fight there. I was just having this conversation with someone yesterday about like, you know, the the boomers did what they knew best and then the gen xers were learning from that and And we're just now getting where yes and we're just now getting to this point now where like the millennials my age range are like starting to understand and we have the science to back up like where all of this like dysfunction came from and again i don't mean dysfunction as like a negative it's just like it's just a thing like like i tell you there's no negative emotions like dysfunction shouldn't be brown eyes it's like be a scary word right we we (laughs) don't know what we don't know until we know it right and so just because we're, we we know it now doesn't mean that just because, you know, the boomers and the Gen Xers didn't know it doesn't mean that they were wrong or bad. They just didn't know. And the but the thing is, now that we do know, if you don't take that knowledge and work with it moving forward, that that's the negative, I guess, if you want to put a negative on anything. I want to talk very uh, slightly about the difference between boomers and Gen X because there is a pronounced one. Gen mm-hmm. X, well, like we're all, we all suffer from the like, hey, nobody raised us. We spent most of our time in the woods. We were like latchkey kids and our parents right. quite recently got divorced and there were no rules around that. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times you've heard your parent viciously ripping down the other person right in front of your face because no one had taught them that like, hey, that's really damaging to a young person. You should not do that. That is not their parent. It does not matter how you feel about them. Please remember they have feelings of their own and you are the adult and you are responsible for behaving as one. And emotional regulation issues as divorce became more common, which it was more common for Gen Xers than it was for boomers. Right, right. that is one of the reasons that, Jacob, please, uh, that is one of the reasons that uh, people in Gen X are more likely to go towards help because they had few guiding factors within their own life. And so mm-hmm. they're the people who raised some millennials and Gen Z and Gen, Gen Y who are far more likely to go towards emotional help and therapy because they were raised by people who suffered from the lack of true guidance, which is what happened to Gen X. So Mm -hmm. Gen X's neglect actually ended up fueling a greater understanding of self and more of a propensity to seek help. And that's that's a giant difference. Boomers turn away from help. That's weak. That's weak. Gen Xers are like, I'm going to go with my therapist because goddamn, I don't feel good. <laughs> like, right, you know, right. They're far more likely to be that. And I wasn't trying to cut you out, but off. But it's no, 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 you're totally fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I agree with you 100%. Everything you said, 100. Yep. Um, so the seven executive functionings, executive, executive functions are the things that allow for success in emotional relationships, professional relationships, and just overall. Our adaptable thinking, planning, self-monitoring, self-control, working memory, time management, and organization. And if you grew up in a severely dysfunctional atmosphere that included substance abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, bullying, 
or neglect. Neglect is a very potent form of abuse as well. I was like, that's on top of it. I spent like, I, I entirely raised myself. It's amazing that I'm not a cannibal. Like, like, nobody was telling me what to do except for summer camp and like going to church on Sundays. Remember, you can teach yourself all of these things. And if you're not able to be able to start putting it together, there are self-help books if you can't afford therapy. There are all kinds of groups and uh, group meetings as well that can help you. Please stop defining yourself by labels because the labels were put in place to help people with a limited understanding of what is contained within a particular box. When we're talking about addiction, we're talking about how addiction and understanding it is in its infancy. When we're talking about something like um, having emotional regulation issues or bipolar, which may actually also be a result of repeated trauma that did not allow you to be in a steady state, causing you to ping pong back and forth. Neuroscience is also something that is always developing. If you have a label, understand that it is a working definition, not the end-all be-all definitive experience of any particular thing. Our understanding of ourselves is slowly developing. You're having so many funny things in the background with your pets as well. It's one of those chaotic days. So Jacob, you're a work in progress on this. I'm a work in progress. Understand that you will always be a work in progress. Even if you came from a completely healthy standpoint in your formative experience, there's always things that you can learn to help yourself be happier and healthier. But before we leave, we're going to revisit how to start approaching emotional regulation. And you will know, you will know if it has been disturbing your ability to have quality and like kind of nourishing relationships in your life, in friendships, with family, in romantic relationships. Understand that all it takes is the ability to commit to yourself. Particularly codependent people really want relationships. And the, the tagline that gets used is you uh -huh. have to love yourself first. And you know, like, you know yeah. how I react to that because yeah. they don't break it down and describe to you why. Because until you fully understand yourself, until you understand yourself and approach yourself with love and compassion, the health of the relationship that you will have with another person will always reflect the health of the relationship that you have with yourself. And that is why if you learn to love yourself first, then every single relationship that you have will begin to become healthier because your standards for yourself are healthier, your approach to yourself is healthier, your understanding of self is healthier, and your compassion for self is healthier. It's not egotistical and it's not vain. And it is not the same thing as needing to stay single. And that mm -hmm. is, I need people who are codependent to hear this one last thing because it's super important. If the idea of being single is distressing to you, you have something to heal. Mm -hmm. In order to be happy in this world, you're only ever really with yourself. When somebody is beside you, you only think you know what their experience is. As I found out, like I, what I felt about a relationship, I was projecting a bunch of the feelings I had, I assume the other person had as well. And it turned mm -hmm. out that that was not true. And mm -hmm. because my perception of the situation was determining how I felt about it. And I'm going to break it down with a super easy example from something I saw in a BuzzFeed listicle. No. Okay. Yes. No, no. Sometimes they're interesting. Sometimes. No, I love BuzzFeed. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> sometimes they're horrible. I love BuzzFeed and I love Board Panda. You know me. I'm like, oh, I yeah. Oh, yeah. Between generational things. Um, the thing was, this person was talking, the, the, the list was like entitled, you know, moments when you knew your relationship was over. And so I'm like, oh, I must read that because it will fuel <laughs> my understanding of what I help people with. And I read it and this, I felt so much for this poor woman and she was relatively young. She was still in her thirties and she was sharing that she had met her husband when she was a teenager, like 16 or 17 years old. And she thought they had the most beautiful storied relationship ever. She met her soulmate when she was still in high school. They got married, they had kids, they were best friends. Like it was like the universe put them together. It was all divine timing. And she was absolutely convinced she was living a romance novel. One day, she overheard her husband telling their origin story to someone else, and what he told them was he met her when she was with another friend. He liked the friend, but the friend wasn't interested, so he went out with her, and it destroyed her. 
because her version of their relationship relied on that perspective of it being super, 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 super special. Mm -hmm. So she thought our whole relationship has been a lie. And here's the thing. No, they still had that relationship. An initial attraction is not the same thing as long-term compatibility. Apparently they divorced, but I really felt for this person because she had invested so much in the idea of this very romantic story that it's like, okay, well, you learned that it was ever so slightly different, but that doesn't mean he stayed with you because you were not his first choice. It's very easy to be attracted to somebody, but it's really much harder to build a long-term relationship, which they had including one of the keys to a long-term healthy relationship, which is friendship. And weirdly enough, the the ex I'm always referring to, we were actually really good friends. We made each other laugh all the time. We had a good time and we talked about, and it actually acted as like something that covered up all of the uh, like emotional dysfunction or emotionally bereft quality for me, because there was like, there was no emotional support for me. And like, in fact, I wasn't supposed to have emotions and all kinds of things, but we got along well as friends. That is the hardest thing to master, but it needs to coincide with the emotional support that goes along with an emotionally healthy relationship. And I felt for this person because her entire world changed and she acted very drastically around a perception and a perspective shift that if she had taken an even greater step to say, well, yeah, but like there were people I liked instantly that nothing happened with. It doesn't mean that I didn't care about him. Mm -hmm. She really like got very much in her own head and in her own way. And the idea of learning how to process these things and to have the relationships that if she had been in a very healthy place, if she wasn't defining her marriage by you are the other half of me and this is a fairy fairy tale story come true, then very likely the relationship would have survived because it would have just been a, huh, God, that's funny type of thing. Because Every single moment they had after that was still genuine and true. It's just that she thought the value lay in it being a cosmic alignment rather Mm. than real relationships, real romances, and really successful everything. Take time, take dedication, and take understanding and compromise. And that is true in absolutely everything. You can meet the love of your life, but if you're both entirely screwed up, then your relationship will reflect that. It is so worthwhile to undertake healing so that absolutely everything in your life can improve. So, hey, Jacob, do you have any closing thoughts on this particular one? Because as as usual, we're going to have to do a series on this. And we joked about calling it We Fucked Up So You Don't Have To. (laughs) 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 Because it's so true. You and I both have experienced a lot of dysfunction. And we started to we decided to start talking about this. Even though it doesn't like make either of us look like shining saints of people, it's so that other people can feel less shame about the stuff that they're not confronting because they've been convinced that it has to do with the quality of their character rather than having been an understandable result of their formative experience. Right. No, it's just like, don't be afraid of the journey, right? Like, I wish that I would have started this journey 10 years ago. Um, I'm not saying that like my life is terrible now, but could be a lot better. Um, I could be a lot more evolved as it were, but yeah, just don't be afraid of the journey. I mean, you got to start somewhere. You might as well start now. Um, It's never too late. Just. Well, and and we crossed paths when neither of us were healthy. (laughs) Neither of us were in a very healthy place and we have been friends and evolved through becoming healthier and healthier. And we talk about things and we're, you know, we're very much on a very similar path and that's why we have such affinity with each other. And please. Yeah, it was very much a, a, yeah. Yeah. The universe brought us together as cliche as that sounds. I I honestly believe it. Like, yeah, like we've talked about before, there's no reason that we should be friends, but it happened. uh, We're not even All right, as usual, thank you so much to anybody. Of course. Please understand that Jacob is so patient and so willing to try and help people that he will feel subjects that I walk into a situation going, I know what we want to talk about. And he's over there with a catcher's mitt showing what curveball is she going to throw is, me yeah. out? <laughs> and he, all, you always do such a great job with it. Hey, Jacob, so people can find you on Facebook, on Southern on Facebook. Style Readings, mm-hmm. and then they can email you as well about yes. reading which is southernstylereadings yes. at gmail.com, right? 100%. Yes. All you right. can reach out to me with any questions, comments, or concerns. 
And I will link his Facebook page and um, I don't think I can link an email address. So I will just put it down there as the email address where people can uh, email you for a price list or for right. whatever else if they're looking for life coaching as well. Um, you can find me at attherisingmoon.com. That is the only way to book me. I will never approach you on any platform trying to sell you a reading. The tarot right. community has a lot of problems with scammers. If you get yeah. a direct message from somebody who is a tarot reader, no, it's not them. It's right. almost always somebody in Nambia who's going to be using a WhatsApp number and they're going to talk and like they use the very same phrases about journeys and I feel very called to do this. And it's easy to spot, but please understand you will not be getting messages from readers, from psychics or spiritual healers. Yeah, we're you not going to cold call you. Exactly. Exactly. And so the only way to reach me is at the rising moon.com. You can see me on YouTube at Chromecast at the rising moon as well. And then you can always look for us here at logical magic examining esoterica. Thank you so much for joining us today. And again, solve your problems, slay your dragons.